Renovation and Wolf Team sold these for the Genesis, a direct port of its original Sharp X68000 counterpart, otherwise titled Soul Feast. And yes, I know there's a Sega CD port, but I digress. Circa 1992. Onto the Game Sack duo, Joe Rutherford and David White. This is for you both. Before we begin, as usual, I'd like to dedicate this to Brooklyn Interactive Group and Somerville Media Center, Boston Open Screen, MAGFest in Maryland, which I'm hauling ass for after New Year's Eve, by the way, PAX East, Anime Boston, DIY The Show, Boston 8-Bit, XBit Gaming, Minus Gaming Fest, Ian Bergerson Care of 16-Bit Heroes from Merrimack, New Hampshire, Jules Carrozza from Genoa Films and Goliath Post, Disasterpiece Theater, High Energy Vintage, Bella aka Girl with Yellow Spoon from LA, Kayla Atino aka Plum Drop 11 from Tewksbury, Refuse Fascism, the Deck Collective, Belmont Media Center, Cambridge Community TV, World Local Film Festival, World Local Productions, Triple E Up Productions, Blasphemous HD, Java Slovakia, The Mount Vernon Kid, Mario B and Nicole, Ashton and John, Fuzzy Proxy, Tryheart, TTB, Gotsicles, Oxygen Star, Scott Buchanan aka Scott Void, Break Stuff Steal Things, Jamie Billings aka The Unicorn Princess, Storm Blooper, and finally, young Swedish activist Greta Thunberg and Boston District 8 City Councilor Kenzie Bach. With those out of our system, onto this game's main premise. It's in the year 3300, literally under another millennium from now, during which human technology has advanced when the AI circuit has been developed and utilized for the newly created GCSWT supercomputer, or the Gatefold computer system in full, existing solely for the unification of every human society through diplomacy. However, the GCSWT turns said societies into a dystopia upon becoming an all-powerful, tyrannical dictator in control of all military actions as the supercomputer sees fit, thus oppressing all humankind of various liberties, meaning that those who oppose the supercomputer would be eliminated upon recognition by its endless, easily-led hordes. Christ, talk about a raging, hard-ass piece of hardware there. No pun intended. The noted scientist Edwin Feast, aka Edwin Dees for this port, has successfully arranged a campaign rebelling against the dreaded supercomputer, thus fleeing and stationing himself near a planet awaiting colonization, Silius. Settling there, Edwin established a resistance group for his campaign and managed to develop and design the titular, multidirectional, and dual occupant space fighter to once and for all end the human suppression caused by GCSWT, and despite this recent accomplishment, was eventually eradicated with other colonists under its command in a violent manhunt before the ship could be mass produced. Now, the fate of the universe rests in the hands of two hopeful crew members of Soul Feast, aka Soul Dees, American pilot Eric Williams and Japanese gunner Misao Hatanaka, as they set out to put GCSWT the fuck out of commission, and thus making it and its automated followers their forever bitches. As far as gameplay, it's far from your typical ash mup, if probably just that, within which you're piloting the aforementioned titular fighting spacecraft and mercilessly obliterating the Christ out of every opposing threat in its path, whilst evading others whenever possible. As expected, the Soul Dees, aka Soul Feast, can shift its position anywhere via the D-pad and can fire its weapons via A, B, and or C. Sonic Syndrome, anyone? Not to mention the top and bottom cannon's firing trajectory, dependent on their customized angle, can also be adjusted via the D-pad, up or down, or for some cases, left or right. Its weapon lineup consists of three different varieties, not counting the default plasma blasts, a slow but strong laser, a volley of missiles, and even the quote-unquote enhanced and doubled variation of the very same plasma blasts, all of which not only can be equipped on either the aforementioned top or bottom cannons or dead center in front of the craft itself, but are also, isn't it obvious, lost instantly upon death, so I'd do whatever the hell I can to keep them intact to fire you, cause shmup standards. And before I forget, your ship is able to bounce off floors, corridors, and other heavy surfaces despite its tendency to get crushed to dick all by unexpected projectiles or collisions with every other adversary, hence one of this game's common complaints. Our overall itinerary, surrounding enemy, and boss lineup are as follows. An asteroid field rife with not only the enemy fleets controlled by the GCSWT, but also fire craters, chunks of debris, satellites with extending poles, ending with a duel against a mechanical crap-like junk-spewing twat face of a droid, 
the Silius Moon Factory filled to the brim with even more mechanical menaces, concluding with a two-part confrontation against both an attack mecha, aka what I like to call Ed 209's dyslexic meth addict former Rumi, and a deadly energy-emitting core, an artificial sun inhabited by more of the same, including explosive missile launchers, attack ships that make the Starbrain from Hudsonsoft Star Soldier look like the Oscillation Overthruster from Buckaroo Banzai, and ruled by a Sandworm Dragon Hybrid creature that rivals those from Dune, Beetlejuice, Tremors, and Zombies Ate My Neighbors combined, a no turning back assault on a massive green battleship, a kid's Irem's R Type, and Flying Edge and Hot Bee's Steel Empire, ending with another against the creature resembling Brain Golem from Konami's Life Force, aka Salamander, that fires off its own peepers, guarded very heavily by a set of gravel based jaws that produce magma every time they smash together. Christ, Namakubi from Zombie Nation much? The Gatefold's Pluto enemy base, within which the shit really starts to hit the fucking fin with interior hazards and more hostile reinforcements than even the Klingons, Kilrathi, and the goddamn Galactic Empire combined. And take note, this game was all the rage when Pluto was still considered an actual planet before the IAU, or the International Astronomical Union, disregarded it as such, ending with a shootout against an assembly of its own laser-powered defense cannons, yet another plethora of intense, heart-stopping interplanetary altercations on Amalthus, that is Jupiter's nearby moon, and finally, back on Earth, both ending with ongoing heavy on duels against armada after armada of computerized guardian attack ships, mechanized creatures, a submarine, and finally the core of the dreaded GCSWT itself, followed by a giant, artificial mantis-like organism that's been pulling its circuitry the whole goddamn time! And allow me to drum this next point into everyone's skulls. Unless your ship is fully enhanced and ready for everything that's ahead of it, expect to crash and burn more often than every derailed subway and street trolley, every derailed commuter rail train, and out-of-control plane combined. The controls are fluid and responsive with absolutely no shortcomings whatsoever, and, as one might expect, the usual don't blame the computer, blame the user doctrine strongly applies here, and as redundant as the gameplay mechanics can be, they're far from an ignominious drag to get the hang of, and then some. As far as this game's challenge is concerned, while many say that this unfairly eclipsed shmup is a fuck all walk in the park, if excessively teetering on the fucking brink of that, I wouldn't expect it to suck your cock in the least, cause it'll ravage your senses worse than both the infamous Trojan Horse virus and the accidental Windows blue screen shutdowns combined. Seriously, Soul Dees, originally Soul Feast, is packed with more than enough shit that'll do more than tempt you to nail your controller straight to the great goddamn wall of China! Case in point, who could forget the third area on the artificial sun with those earlier reference missile launchers, let alone more of the relentless threats of GCSWT's controlled attack fleets who want dick all else but to make you their filthy ass crack whore faster than you can read what's expect when you're expecting start to finish or walk on a tightrope blindfolded and 30,000 stories above the ground after downing 20 shots of Jägermeister and Svedka non-stop. As long as you're aware enough to endure and overcome these, amongst other unexpected dangers, however, the majority of your quest should be duck soup with sides of Brussels sprouts, lamb-filled mozzarella sticks, if there ever existed any, and a pint of sangria mixed with Red Bull. Starting out with only 4 ships, or 99 if you input a code, which of course will be mentioned in the credits, and an infinite amount of continues at the title, though in this game's particular case, your ass is sent back to Stage 5 if you get crushed at any point beyond there, except in Normal Mode, ditto in the Sega CD version. I wouldn't get too discouraged should any of what I outlined turn out to be one living apocalyptic, mind-raping clusterfuck of a cataclysm after another! While the presentation's not much to gloat, go apeshit, or cream one's boxers over nowadays, its underlying graphical aspects are far from hideous as fuck eyesores and blemishes. Apart from an obvious lack of depth in the parallax scrolling, as opposed to this game's competitors at the time, or look at you again, Lightning Force, all of the main and opposing ship designs, especially the Soul Dees, aka Soul Feast itself, and the diverse choice of weapons it deploys, don't disappoint in the least, and nor do the varying, if overused and redundant, beyond any rational thoughts, stage backgrounds. It's no wonder how much form and character was integrated due largely to the visual construction of the former indicated types, let alone the brooding and relentless as fuck boss enemies, notwithstanding the awkward yet fluid Mode 7 esque rotations and movements of their ligaments, and the occasional flickering that many have been bitching about time after time, thereby adding to its difficulty factor. Another feature worth noting is that the opening and ending sequences are expanded in terms of plot description, in text form of course, not counting the mission descriptions in between stages, as opposed to its Sega CD counterpart, which, of course, features a shitload of cutscenes and voiceover narration work by an uncredited pre tsunami Steve Bloom. Having been under the cruel control of the GCSWT for centuries, the humans unite and plan to end the oppressive control of this machine. Unfortunately, the human underground movement is detected by the interplanetary security force of the GCSWT before the overthrow can begin. We could be in for a battle with the Star Garrison at five locations on our way to Earth. Be on the lookout when we near Sirius, the weapons plant on the outer rim of Sirius, the artificial sun, the Pluto base in Jupiter. 
that aside, while many convey that the overall look is characterless and mediocre at best, I'm officially going on record stating the antithesis and have absolutely no intention whatsoever of making any changes or apologies for them now under any motherfucking circumstances. Music and sound wise, orchestrated by the incomparable Motoi Sakuraba, and for more details on him, refer back to my Final Zone in Granada review from last year. The overall selection of themes don't disappoint either, as they make TikTok and every number in Andrew Lloyd Webber's cats look like lame ass motherfucking kindergarten nursery rhymes. Nothing against their fans, by the way. Not only do they tie in splendidly with each underlying event, let alone stand out from one another, they make every effort imaginable to keep the game from getting too goddamn stale. And thanks to those conditions, there isn't a dull ass moment whatsoever. The sound effects, however, are hit or miss, if mainly the latter, considering they've been used a lot in other Wolf Team titles, but as it turns out, some of them are either altered or of some other foreign elements on which many can't even place that leave god knows how much to be desired. At least they're not too dissonant and ear rapey, however. Well, before I go any further, take note of my top 10 songs displayed here, with one honorable mention provided below. Replayability wise, considering the heavy competition it was faced with at the time, hence the other titles that were referenced last time, again no pun intended, not to mention the plethora of shortcomings that hold it back from reaching classic status, both of which I more than extremely advocate referring back to since I'm at no liberty to recap them. If you're more than willing to buckle down and withstand all the bullfuck this game can and will throw your way, while at the very least giving yourself a 3-5 week break in between for the sake of your own sanity, you'd wind up becoming the sovereign supreme emperor of dipshits and in the process doing yourself a pathetic, inexcusable disservice by leaving Soul Deece out in the fucking cold. Therefore, what's my all-seeing final verdict, one might ask? By this juncture, it should be a cinch to gauge why this 16-bit shmup has been unfairly overshadowed by the majority of its competition at the time, not to mention its often hinted and slightly more advanced Sega CD counterparts, I might add. In spite of its many downsides, however, I highly recommend both of them, or just stick with the latter, your choice. And let me honestly assure you, there is no excuse not to warrant a spot in your Genesis and or CD libraries for this. What are you waiting for, the debut of My Hero Academia Season 5? Get your ass out there and acquire and experience it any way you can. Trust me, it may not have the same quality as the other Genesis shmups, but Jesus rim jobbing Christ in a GIMP costume swimming around in Davy Jones' locker, giving Calamaria from Cuphead the old in-out, in-out doesn't come close. Anyways, with that said, I wish everyone the merriest of holidays and yet another kick-ass new year. Until then, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God triumphantly signing off.